Well, let's go ahead and start, shall we? Father God, I'm very aware of whose presence I stand in, and I thank you for the honor that you've given me and the privilege to speak your word. And I thank you for this wonderful place, O oh God, in the natural realm to release your word. We thank you for these wonderful people that are passionate about you and your purpose. We give you praise for them. And all of those that are watching tonight and in the future, we welcome you to hear the word of God tonight in the name of Jesus. Father, lead us and guide us, and we give you praise for the good outcome in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to teach for a while tonight about the superlative creation and the sovereign creator. Superlative creation and the sovereign creator. So let's begin at the beginning, shall we? Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1 says very clearly in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So here the natural world creation matrix was activated and uh, the natural realm moved into creation mode. It was a process that got initiated. It was an original idea that he had. No one else could have come up with this. He did, and he initiated the process. In Psalm 104 and verse number 5, the word of God says that he, referring to God, he established the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. So he was the foundational creator of the natural realm, established it, planted it, positioned it permanently under his glory and the benefit of those who would enjoy this wonderful natural world of reality. In Psalm 147 is another place that I would like to reference tonight in speaking about this. In Psalm 147 and verse number four, again, referring to creator God, he counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them, or he calls them all by their given name. We know there are trillions of stars. We know also that God as a superior intellect is omniscient. He knows all things at all times. And he indeed named every single star, however many trillion of stars there are. And isn't it kind of amazing that he gave Adam the privilege of naming the animals and the fowl of the air. And so, but, but God himself named all of the stars, calls them by their given names. I would like to think that God references the stars by name every day. And uh, he takes note of that fact. This is what I have done, and I've not forgotten you. Even though you were an 85th trillion star that I created, I remember you. Just like he created each of us, and every day he remembers us. And he wants us to know, I've not forgotten you. I know you by name. And I'm grateful that I did. I'm sure that God says that about you every single day. So here we see then this superior intellect, this omniscience, this uh, superlative uh, creative power that God uh, initiated the natural realm of reality that did not exist before he began to cause this to take place. And uh, let's look at another place now in uh, the book of Job. And when you look in the book of Job, there's all kinds of insight available there about creation and many, many other subjects. But in Job chapter 9, we see these words. Let's begin looking at verse number 7 of Job 9. And speaking again of God, it says, It is God. It is God who commands the sun not to shine and sets a seal upon the stars. Verse number eight says, it is God who alone stretches out the heavens and tramples down the waves of the sea. Verse nine says, it is God alone who makes the bear, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, naming some of the constellations. So again, we see here underlined for us the omnipotent power, the power of creation that our God has to create all of the stars and uh, spread them out through a blackness of space that he created also. 
And uh, but then it goes into verse number 10 and it says it is God who does great things unfathomable. They get to the point where you can't figure out how God did these things, but he did them. So they're unfathomable, uh, wondrous works without number. And then this wonderful phrase here, were he to pass by me, I would not see him. Were he to move past me, I would not perceive him. So God is the omnipotent creator, but he's invisible, he's immaterial, and yet he exists. And this writer recognized that I don't see God, but I know he's real. And this is what he was really underlining. And when I see that phraseology there in Job, it takes me to the place where Paul, who was well versed in the scripture, by the way, he was a theologian, uh, very intelligent, and he knew he was uh, sat under Gamaliel and he had all of these intellectual capacities. So he knew the scripture very, very well. And so being versed in the scripture, he knew those words, those words from Job. He knew them well. And so when he came into Athens, according to Acts chapter 17, when Paul arrived in Athens and he began to look and see what was there. In verse number 16 of Acts 17, it says, Now, while Paul was uh, waiting for them at Athens, in Greece, of course, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day, every day with those who happened to, to be present. And this was kind of a common cultural reality every day there would be this gathering of individuals and they'd begin to discuss things and kind of describe some of that right here in verse 18 because it says, and also some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers uh, were conversing with him and some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be proclaiming strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Let's kind of take a moment here and realize who he was surrounded by these were intellectual elites, uh, Epicureans. These were, these were apostles or disciples of Epicurus. Uh, and Epicurus's philosophy was he was searching for pleasure and not truth, looking for pleasure, not absolute truth. And he relied upon experience, not reason. He just wanted uh, the feel good type of a thing. And so, and the Stoics, as it mentions here, were basically those who trusted in fate. God's already decided everything. It's going to be what it's supposed to be, que sera, sera. And so these were the Stoics. And there it says here they were conversing with him in my Bible. But really it's stronger than that. They were disputing with him. They were arguing with him. They, had, uh, uh, they were confronting him. And some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Which literally is an insult. He, he, they were saying to him, this guy is an intellectual scavenger. He's just picking up bits and pieces here and throwing them out there and see what our response would be. So they were being very, very insulting to him. In fact, they were saying he seems to be uh, proclaiming strange deities or demonic deities is what they were saying because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Well, of course, we know this is not the case at all. But in this encounter here, it says, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, Eruf which is the uh, is on Mars Hill, as it says later, saying, uh, may we know what this new teaching is, which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, and we want to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all of the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. I'll tell you what, uh, culture wants to know, they, they still want to know something new. Uh, and so when we be, when we present them with a tidbit of something that's new, a factual reality about our God and who we serve, we need to be prepared to follow that up and give them instruction in depth that they might not just know a new sound, but they know the depth of that sound, the gravity of what we're saying, and the effectiveness of what we're releasing into their ears. So when we get into crowds of people that we don't know really what they're all about, if we say something, we better have something to back it up. And it's based upon fact, not upon fiction. And we know that this is true. So Paul, of course, was well prepared. Verse 22, it says, And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, And that basically is uh, referring to the hill of Eris, which is the god of war, 
or Mars Hill. And he said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship. So these were worshipers. Uh, everyone worships something. And it's from your heart. Whatever you believe in your heart, you worship that. Whether it's intellect, technology, God, whatever it might be. But you do worship something. Uh, good times like the Epicureans. But here we see that he noticed there were objects of worship. And he said, I also found an altar. An altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So they were offering, evidently, sacrifices, offerings to a God that they didn't even know who the God was. But somehow they sensed there's this God that we can't put our finger on. We can't name him, but we feel like we need to worship him. So there's that inner sense of eternity that God has placed in every single individual, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse number 11. We all have a sense of eternity and a sense of divine purpose. Everyone does. So they made this memorial to the unknown God. And he says, uh, what therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So he went right into their wheelhouse. And he says, the God who made the world, the natural realm of reality, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. And he made from one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not Far from each one of us, he's invisible, he's immaterial, and he's all powerful. For in him we live and move and exist. And even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Meaning they understood, at least in part, that there was a relationship available here. Offspring, relationship, a father and child relationship. So even they were able to discern that much. So we're seeing here that uh, that scripture from Job came into real value on that day when Paul really used that to let them know, here's what this is all about. The one who created the natural realm, you see the invisible God when you see the material world. That's God. That's evidence. See, we, our faith is not based on nothing. It's based on substance. And substance is evidence. Evidence is something that to prove is true. And so we understand then Paul was really getting down to the nitty gritty. You continue reading about that. And some believed him. Some still thought he was a nut and some wanted to talk to him later. Went on and on and on. But that's all we need to deal with that tonight. But he was ready using something they could relate to. To connect them with something they couldn't relate to. The invisible world with the natural world. And so this is something maybe we could learn from and be prepared uh, as I've been teaching recently, and I've really been enjoying this, that science and faith are best friends forever. They're connected. And so let's go into some of that tonight, maybe, because uh, the Holy Scripture teaches that nature is real. Okay, full stop. Hinduism, however, teaches the material world of objects is maya or illusion. The Hindus believe that this natural world is just illusion. The natural world owes its orderly concourse, its orderly flow to the free choice of an intelligent creator who could have made nature otherwise. Think about it. He could have made it disorderly, but he's a God of order. That's why, again, I underline each, underline each time we can expect our out of order composition to come into order inevitably because we serve a God of order. And so here we see uh, the natural world owes its orderly concourse because of the intelligent creator who created it. And he could have made nature otherwise. But it says in my Bible, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, it says, And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So he made it good. 
Very good. And that word good is tob, which means the best. God looked at everything he made and he says, that's the best. This is really, really good. And so we understand then that our God created on purpose this natural realm good. Now, Satan has tried to mess it up. Man has messed it up. But we see that inevitably there's going to be an order of God that will prevail. And the creation that God had in mind and originally will come back into order unto the glory of God. So as we process through this, let me just take you another location here for a moment in this superlative creation, sovereign creator teaching and refer you to a Nobel Peace Prize or rather a Nobel Prize winner in science. His name was uh, he was a biochemist by the name of Melvin Calvin. He was a Nobel Prize winning biochemist. And he made this statement. He's a scientist, remember. And he made this statement as enunciated first in the Western world by the ancient Hebrews, namely that the universe is governed by a single God. This monotheistic view seems to be the historical foundation for modern science. He was laying it out. He says this uh, creation was by a one God. It was not a creation by committee. It was creation by one creator. And even the scientists were beginning to understand that's absolutely the truth. That We cannot deny this any longer. A physicist by the name of C.F. von Weizsacker, uh, and I'll paraphrase what he said, but that's, this is a very important statement that he made in 1964 when he said, Matter, which God has created from nothing, strictly follows the rules which its creator has laid down for it. Think about that for a moment. First of all, man cannot create matter or energy. God did. But the point of that is, from this viewpoint of this, this physicist is, Matter which God has created from nothing, ex nihilo, out of nothing, he created matter and energy. But that matter and energy strictly follows the rules which its creator has laid down for it. Which means if God says you declare something ethereal into material form, I will do it. Because it's my law of energy and matter. Energy and matter can trade places, but man can't create either one of them. But God created energy and matter, and by his word, the energy of his word can cause things of the spirit to materialize. This to me is very, very important because we've taught this for years saying faith, and it is faith. You believe it and you declare it. It's based on substance. It's based on evidence. It's based on truth. It's based on something that's factual. So the result should be what I believe God can do and trans form something from the spirit realm into the natural realm is because he laid down the rules for that. He's the one that created matter and energy. So it's his rules. It's his desire. And so we understand that we can draw from that and bring things into existence. And, you know, we've kind of deviated from that. Not really deviated, but it's kind of in the back of our thinking right now because there's so much going on in this chaotic uh, culture that we're in and Sometimes we begin to uh, almost gravitate away from the fundamental things that we need to really be focusing on and doubling down on. And I think we need to get back to calling things into order of a natural realm, change into the form God wants it to be unto the glory of God. So anyway, a superlative creation, a sovereign creator. And God, according to Genesis 1, 31, looked at what he created, said it's very good, not just good, but very good. Very tobe. And uh, so let's go a, a little bit further into this tonight, just a little bit further. The natural order is a product of a single intelligence, an omniscient creator, God, who is depicted in the Bible as the creator of the entire universe, the inventor of atomic structure and subatomic structure. It is God who directs the path of billions of galaxies and trillions of stars. Yet he also chose to create a people for himself. That is a essential, fundamental something to dwell upon. He also decided of his own volition 
to create a people for himself, a natural physical species endowed with divine characteristics. The Judeo-Christian believers understand, and we do, the material world is God's creation over which God has explicitly given humanity authority. We understand that. We know that's true. It's in the word. Therefore, we can operate as a functionary in that true premise. So here we see, in fact, to underline that even more, Jesus, who came, he was God in human form, taught that message and demonstrated its its veracity every day. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of heaven is here. Watch me heal this person. Watch me walk on water. Watch me cause this storm to lay down. So we understand then that humanity's dominion over earth realm has been given to us by God himself. And then Jesus also in resurrected form. He occupies a natural corporeal body. He's not a spirit floating around. He's in a natural physical body emphasizing humanity's appointed state and dominion and also reminding us because that new body has scars on it. What he went through to provide for us the ability to rule in the earth realm under the glory of God. So this natural realm uh, dominion is underlined by that very thing. And so I want to go into just a little bit of that tonight. And this teaching, everybody can really take uh, almost pass out from unbelief, but this will be a very short teaching tonight. So those that don't know me just realize that they can, they may pass out when I get finished with this. <laughs> but let's continue this just a little bit further. This superlative creation and sovereign creator. Because in Psalm 103 and verse 19, It says very clearly that God is sovereign. It says in Psalm 103, verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens. So his kingdom positional rule, the throne is in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. So we know that creation is by God. He's the creator. It is his creation. He's the creator and he's the possessor of creation. So we see here, though, uh, that we're about to get into something that is so absolutely fabulous. The, The mysterious plan of God is exactly that. It's so mysterious. He selected me, a little boy born in Okima, Oklahoma, in the middle of nowhere. And he wanted me to come into the ministry and learn something about dealing with the realities of the kingdom and teach the kingdom and begin to function in the kingdom and be passionate about it and also demonstrate it at least in a certain degree and incrementally and begin to show that it's real. God chose me. What a mysterious plan that he had all of this set in place for us to begin to function in, not just to enjoy, but to function in. And I always almost I'm nonplussed by that to go, God, really, I'm amazed it's it's almost like the, David's incredulous tone, and I'll read to you in just a moment when he was wondering about this whole thing, and I'll read that to you in just a few moments. But uh, here we see that by, by divine providence, by divine providence, humanity has been given material world dominion. By divine providence, humanity has been given material world dominion. In Genesis 1, 28, very clearly, first of all, here God had a God made a decision in, in Genesis chapter one. He made a decision to uh, make man in his own image and likeness. And then he decreed that decision. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And then he demonstrated what he meant by doing it. He created humanity and it says in verse number 28, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over. And so that word rule, which we've read many times, is the word rada there in Hebrew, and it means to tread down, it means to subjugate, it means to have dominion over and prevail. It's no question. It's it's not, uh, you don't have have to wonder about that. No, it means that God was giving humanity uh, material world authority. Rule over your environment. And he's never changed his mind about that. The circumstances have caused that to be delayed. But we understand that God reiterated that. 
time and time again in the word. And he wants us to get a hold of that again tonight, new and fresh, that God wants us to rule over. He wants us to tread down what needs to become submissive. Come on, somebody. He wants to understand that we've been given permission to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over anything that might harm us. And God says, I want you to do this because he said, I saw the, the reason that all of that exists. I saw him fall. I saw him fall. I was there. I'm remembering it right now, Jesus was saying. I saw him leave instantly. And now you've been given power and authority to rule over this one who's tried to mess up the material realm. So we understand these are true things. And then in Psalm 8 is the one that I was referring to, where David just is absolutely incredulous uh, on this particular day when he, um, not for the first time, I'm sure, but he began to write down, how deeply this was affecting him in uh, Psalm 8. And we see in verse number 3, he said, When I consider, so he's taking time to think about this, When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, you've appointed them, you, you've ordained them, he says, What is man that you do take thought of him and the son of man that you do care for him? Yet you've made him a little lower than God, and you do crown him with glory and majesty. And then here we go again. He understood this. You do make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Now, that word rule in Hebrew there is mashal, which means also dominion and power. So he says, you have made man to have dominion and power. Let's get this. You've made man purposely to have dominion and power over all the works of your hands. Everything in the natural material world, he is is prepared for you to subjugate and rule over. Uh, This is like almost going back to faith 101. But we need to understand the essential fundamental things of God never change. And we need to get to these essential things being brought to the forefront again. So David was absolutely uh, considering this as what God had done. And he was included in that. And then he underlined it by how to cause this whole reality to become kinetic or functional. In verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So the name of our God is the key to kinetic energy producing things in the order of God unto his glory and our benefit. So it's this kinetic movement by the name of God himself in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, be healed in the name of Jesus. Your finances will prosper in the name of Jesus. Your family will come into order in the name of Jesus. All depression will dissipate in the name of Jesus. You'll arise above it all under the glory of God. So in the name of Jesus, which is the name that has authority, power and influence in the material world. And we've been authorized to use that name to cause change to take place in our several lives. Psalm 115. Psalm 115, 115 and verse 15. May you be blessed of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The heavens of the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to men. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a divine endowment. God has given you earth realm dominion. He's given it to you. And what you and I make of it is really our choice. We can make the most of it and redeem our time, or we can just let things happen and become a stoic, (laughs) leave everything to fate. Well, God's already figured everything out. Just don't worry about it. No, God wants us to use the intellect he's given. See that, that omniscience of God, that intellect is from whence our intellect flows. We have intellect because of his intelligence. We would have nothing without his intellect. And so we need to understand that. So that means like him in his image and his likeness, since he shared a portion of his intellect with us, we can coincide with him. We can become very uh, uh, cohesive with him. We can think like God thinks. 
and begin to speak words that God wants us to speak. So I thank God that he uh, created intelligence, invested that in us unto the glory of God and our benefit in Jesus' name. So let's go to Jeremiah. The weeping prophet. I guess he took time out from crying. Do bit this word for us. Jeremiah 27, verse 5. God says, I have made the earth, the men and the beasts which are on the face of the earth, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. So literally, God has a way supernaturally to give you, give you earth realm dominion. If he sees you as pleasing in his sight, and that word means literally upright, righteous, by the blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus has become our righteousness and our salvation. So he sees us. We are seen as righteous in his sight. Therefore, we are, we've met the eligibility requirement. So we can understand then that we uh, realize that God on purpose wants to give us, he wants to give us power in the earth unto his glory and our benefit. So Jesus began to teach that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what he was saying was the arrival of the sovereign transcendent rule of God has been reinitiated through a human being. Uh, the rule of God and his dominion is now reinstituted. And I'm here to let you know that and also to begin to extrapolate that and let you begin to participate in the reality of what I'm saying to you. The kingdom is here. Begin to think that way. That's what he's saying. Repent. Think this way. The kingdom is here. Okay. 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 Then that's something that we can put into practice every single day because I believe every single day there's something that is, is in opposition to kingdom rule and kingdom order. So every day we can bring into our mind and our understanding, I'm going to think this, the kingdom of God has arrived. So that thing, whatever it is, now has no negotiating rights. Because the kingdom of God, the sovereign power and his dominion, the rulership of God is now in the earth being dispensed through human beings. That's God's methodology. I don't know why, but that's how he does it. And Jesus was the first example of that because he went about teaching this, healing everybody that needed to be healed. He was teaching the kingdom and healing people. And so God wants us to bring into our mindset that he's given us skill sets to deal with what our mind is having difficulty with. Come on, somebody. Uh, we're having difficulty with that situation. God has given you a skill set in the spirit to take care of that situation. It's called kingdom rule. Kingdom rule. And so what I'm talking about tonight is that this thing was initiated by Jesus. It was uh, never uh, removed by God. It's still in the earth. And so Jesus was teaching that. And then he went on to teach in chapter 5 of Matthew Verse 1 says, and when he saw the multitudes, uh, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And verse 2 says, and opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, and then he began to show what he was teaching, this uh, method of teaching called didasco. His calculus was to get people to think differently because the way they'd been thinking was not getting them ahead. There was no progress there. Nothing was changing for them. So he's giving them something new to think about. And then the first thing he said was blessed or makarios. Or in other words, uh, uh, you have the characteristics of God dwelling in you. You're a human being. And he says makarios are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that is a definite present tense promise. The kingdom is here. And then he goes on to teach through that teaching. If you move down to verse number five. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. So that's a progressive promise. It's a process into that. And then verse 10 says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So as we see here then, there's a kingdom has arrived. It's currently available. That's a present tense promise. Then there's this process promises. 
these things that you move into incrementally. But in the process, you're going to have opposition. If you don't have opposition, you're probably not in the right process. I'm just saying. But if you are having opposition, you're in a good place. Because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. That's a present tense declaration. So here, natural world dominion. Here's the arrival of the sovereign transcendent rule and the reinitiation of humanity's natural world dominion. It's going on right now. And now I'm going to finish this teaching by giving you this last little uh, part here. And I, re- I entitled this particular part, Optimal Kingship Participation. What does optimal mean? It means best. The best you can do when it comes to kingship participation in Daniel chapter 7. This portion of scripture I love. I've taught from it many, many times. Daniel 7 verse 13. Daniel was having this vision. I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion, glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and men of every language may serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Of course, that's a depiction of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the son of the king, receiving the sovereignty of the kingship from his father. But then it goes into verse 18. But for the saints of the highest one, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Verse 21 says, I kept looking and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them persecution, persecution because the kingdom is yours until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints, the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So there's a time of arrival when you possess kingdom reality. Then you move to verse 25. And he, the enemy, will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. But the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey him. Inevitably, God's original order will be replaced and the order of God will prevail. Revelation eleven fifteen. And the seventh angel sounded. And there arose loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Aren't you glad that Jesus waited and didn't take up Satan on his offer to receive all the kingdoms when he's in the wilderness? Amen. So here the timing is right. And of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And then, of course, Revelation five, verse number nine. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain. You were violently butchered and slaughtered. And you did purchase for God with your blood. Men from every tribe, tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God. And they will reign upon the earth. Optimal kingdom kingship participation. That's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions?